I was just having, here we go. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Shane Sater. Shane is a naturalist and a writer with a passion for the stories of the landscape around us. He produces a weekly podcast and blog focused on seasonal happenings in nature, and he features the work of Montana biologists and naturalists. And you can find the blog and podcast at whatsgoingonblog.org. So tonight's program is a condensed version of just a few of his stories from this past summer. Shane holds a bachelor's in environmental science from Carroll College with a focus in insect ecology. And his field experience includes botanical work for the Forest Service, rangeland surveys for the Montana Natural Heritage Program, and a variety of bird surveys. So welcome, Shane. Hi, so glad to be here with all of you. Can you hear me well? Yes. Coming on awesome. loud and clear, and I can see your screen. Yay, okay, well, that's good. It's always exciting when we aren't starting out with technical difficulties. Um, I am so excited to be here with all of you tonight. Thanks so much for joining me. I see a lot of familiar names and a lot of also not familiar names, so I'm just really excited uh, to get to talk with you all tonight. And so it was about 10 years ago that I really started getting deeply interested in ecology. At that point, I was still living in Idaho. And one fall, I just spent a lot of time sitting near a fruiting blue elderberry and watching the birds that were coming into it. And really from that time, maybe before then even, I've just been fascinated with learning about the stories of the interactions between animals and plants. And these are the sorts of stories that you know, it isn't hard to look around and find these. We can find them just about everywhere. So this fall in Idaho, this particular fall, I especially was noticing buried thrushes and bohemian waxwings that were coming in and feeding on the elderberry fruits. Now, there was also a patch of mullen nearby, these dead mullen stalks, and I noticed that a downy woodpecker came in and was feeding on, I'm guessing, the seeds, unless they're, maybe they're little insects in those seed heads as well. And so as I got more into the world of ecology, I just kept on seeing these interactions between animals and plants just about everywhere I looked. There in the Idaho Panhandle, there were viries and red-eyed vireos, two birds that were pretty uncommon in that area. And the place where I could reliably see both of those species was in cottonwood stands with a really nice shrubby understory. So once again, sort of on a more zoomed out macro scale. Here was this relationship in terms of habitat between plants and the animals that they were supporting. But it was really only two years ago when I was midway through my environmental science degree at Carroll College in Helena that I really started getting into the weeds, if you'll pardon the pun, with the complexity and awesomeness of the interactions between animals and plants. And insects were really the missing link that just brought this world alive. And thanks to my advisor, Dr. Grant Hokett, who was just an awesome, really supportive advisor and also a great naturalist, I got to spend a substantial uh, chunk of the final two years of my degree getting up to speed on the basics of local um, insect identification and then really getting into the ecologies of these insects as well. So as Beth mentioned at the beginning, uh, with Dr. Doug Tallamy's work and the work of his students, primarily uh, in the Eastern US, this is another you know, related topic. They've been looking primarily at butterflies and moths and their larval host plants. And the, then the connections between these caterpillars and the songbirds that they feed. And what they've found is that certain species of native plants seem to be especially important for supporting just an incredible diversity of butterfly and moth larvae. And so around Helena, a few of the plants that show up very high on that list include cottonwoods and willows, and then also choke cherries, which you can see in this photo, alders, pines, and then when we get into herbaceous plants, goldenrods are really high on that list. Now with my insect field, 
field work, which was much smaller in scale and much more qualitative. I was seeing similar patterns with flower visitors. So even when I was out in the field and wasn't able initially to identify nearly everything I was looking at, what I was noticing was just this very clear pattern that some flowers seemed to be drawing in this incredible diversity of insects. And also these insect communities really were substantially different from one patch of flowers to another. So this was pretty cool. And for my thesis, I was really zooming in on some of this diversity. So I was trying to identify insects to species. And then when I could get to that point, whether it was flower visitors or grasshoppers, I also looked at dragonflies and damselflies and a few other groups. When I got to the point of species ID, then I was able to really get into the details of the particular life histories of these insects. And what I was finding is that for so many insects, their life histories involve these intimate relationships with particular species of plants, typically native plants. There's a lot of coevolutionary history there. And even with something like dragonflies that are generalist predators and don't have like a really strong particular relationship with particular species of plants, except in some cases they do for egg laying sites. Uh, all we have to do is look like one or two trophic levels away, like what are they feeding on? And we're bound to find that there's some relationship, some probably strong relationship with plants there. So this is not probably going to be surprising to any of you. I mean, we know that when it comes to terrestrial ecosystems, plants are photosynthesizing. They're just the, the trophic foundation of our food webs and everything, we and all of the wildlife around us rest on that diversity of plants. So the point of this presentation is to take a look at a few of these really cool plant-animal interactions. And I hope that I also leave you with a bunch of unanswered questions and also with the curiosity to start observing more in your own contexts. Because this stuff is really, really complicated. I think it's awesome. And I'm also definitely not an expert. So basically tonight, I just want to open Pandora's box, if you will, to this world of plant-animal interactions and all of the complexity there. And once I'm done talking at you, which hopefully won't put you to sleep and maybe will be interesting and entertaining and all of that, uh, I really am excited for our discussion and questions period as well, because I'm really interested to hear from all of you. There's just so much to learn about all of this. So I'm looking forward to both your questions and inspirations about my talk, but also how does this apply to the contexts that you're familiar with in the field where you work or play, these questions of plant-animal interactions and, and all of this stuff. So after I finished my insect thesis this spring at Carroll College, I wanted to keep on learning about all of this stuff because really at heart, I'm a naturalist. So I love field work, I love science, but I also love stories. And I love just like dabbling a little bit with one group of insects and then switching to another one, trying to learn as many of our local plants as I can, bringing in some birds, maybe knowing enough to be dangerous about geology and hydrology and stuff like that. So just really trying to understand the whole system and all of these different stories and how they intertwine. And at the same time, I really have a passion for storytelling and education. And also, while I've been taking this really deep dive into the world of insects and plants over the past few years, I've been watching what's been happening in the Helena Valley. And that's a lot of development. I've just seen large houses pop up all across the valley. And most of those houses have you know, several acres of green irrigated lawn that's kept very carefully manicured around them in place of whatever habitat used to exist there. Now, I suspect that probably most of those homeowners haven't been able to spend a lot of time searching through goldenrod patches and seeing the diversity of insects there. I'm guessing that most of them just may not have a clue about our choke cherries and how during fall migration, there's just this awesome diversity of you know, robins, cedar waxwings, 
Wilson's warblers, yellow rumped warblers stopping over in the choke cherries. Because I'm guessing that if they had had the chance to have experiences like that, I think their yards might look a lot different than they do. I know my yard would. It would definitely have some choke cherries at least tucked in a corner, good patch of goldenrods, and a bunch of other native plants. And then I would be seeing all of these birds and insects and all of the wildlife that, that relate to those plants. And so that's why instead of continuing uh, with my paid fieldwork positions, this year I started doing a basically unpaid uh, nature blog and podcast, both because I wanted to keep learning about these topics that fascinate me so much, and not just learning by myself, but also learning from all of you and really putting myself in this space where I get to have conversations with people who are doing work in the field, who are parts of our communities and uh, maybe don't do this professionally, but just have a passion or curiosity for it and just learning from all of you, but then also sharing these stories and really trying to make them accessible to people who may not be naturalists, who may not be botanists or biologists or birders or even gardeners, but just really to, to try to be also reaching some of those people who may not have a clue about what's going on around us in terms of wildlife and plants and might really benefit from this and find some inspiration here. And so what I'm about to share with you, as Beth mentioned, is just a quick, really abridged version of four of the stories that I covered uh, through my writing over the summer. These are also all on my website, which I'll share again at the end, both as articles with photos and then also as podcasts. And I do kind of skim through some literature in my presentation tonight that does underlie some of these stories. A lot of this is my field work, but it's really based on the work of other people. And just in the interest of time, I'm not going to be mentioning the names of authors and the titles of those articles. But if you want to get more in depth on that, you can find that all uh, cited in these articles on my website. So before I jump into these stories, the other thing I want to mention really briefly is just that I and all of us living here on this landscape rest not only on our own knowledge and the knowledge of the Western scientific community, but also on thousands and thousands of years of indigenous history on this landscape. And where I am uh, currently living and giving this presentation from in Missoula, um, this is particularly uh, the homeland of the Kootenai, Salish, and Kalispe people. And the word for Missoula in Salish is Enchla'ai, which uh, means place of the small bull trout. So even in just the languages and the stories of these cultures, we have this really intimate connection with place. So I'm really in debt to that and to these thousands of years of, of tending of the landscape and reciprocal relationship with it. And so I just want to acknowledge that and, and bring that in tonight, that even though this is me speaking from my experience as a recent settler on this landscape, there's a lot of history here of this sort of inquiry and storytelling. And I'm really grateful to, to be jumping in as part of that tradition in a way. So this summer, I really wanted to dive in to the ecology of 10 petal blazing star, Menzelia decapitala. This is in Helena along the Centennial Trail, early August, midsummer. And this plant has just fascinated me for years. It's native, it's really striking. I mean, it would look pretty good in, in a garden, I think. It's got these just massive white flowers. And you can see in this picture, this is during the daytime and these flowers are closed. The leaves kind of have this, uh, these sawtoothed margins and you can't see it in, these, in this picture, except maybe if you use, use your imagination some. But if you feel these leaves, they're extremely sandpapery. They've got a very rough texture. So I was just really curious about, about these plants. Why are the leaves textured the way they are? What are this plant's relationships with, with various insects? And just really what's going on with this plant? Because I suspected that there was more of a story here than met the eye just walking past it. And so I started off by doing some literature review. 
And so I found um, some interesting things here. One thing was I was surprised that there really was not much in the literature about Menzelia decapitala, just a few studies that I found. But I did find some more information about some sister species, some related species of Menzelia. And that started to give me some clues about what might be going on with these plants. So Menzelia pumilla, one of, one of these relatives, I found some information from the literature that this plant as well has sort of these sandpapery textured leaves. Uh, and so it's got these clinging hairs. And what scientists were finding is that there were actually a lot of dead insects stuck to these plants. So that's pretty interesting. It's not every day that you go out in the field and see dead insects stuck to plants. And these researchers uh, were really interested in this and proposed a couple of ideas about why it might be that this potentially could be beneficial for these plants. One idea that seems uh, like it makes a lot of sense is just simple protection. We of course have lots of plants that protect themselves from herbivory, whether it's through different, uh, different arrangements of hairs or whether it's through their phytochemistry and their toxicity. But they also proposed another idea. And as far as I know, this hasn't been tested by anyone to see if this actually holds water, so to speak, or not. But that is nitrogen enrichment. Could it be that these dead insects trapped on these plants get washed down into the soil? Now, this is a plant that typically grows in some really harsh, dry sites. So perhaps um, these plants are benefiting from the nitrogen enrichment. Now, I also found some information about another sister species, Mentzelia nuda. That one blooms in the afternoon, and there are a variety of bees and small flies that visit the flowers, including a couple of bees that are specialists on Mentzelias, spe on, yeah, on Mentzelia, specifically Perdita wootenai and Indrina Mentzeliae. So that's kind of interesting. Now, basically the extent of the literature that I was able to find on our species of question, Menzelia decapitala, was really just one paper from Nebraska. And in that study, the researchers found that for this species, the flowers open about an hour before sunset and then close near midnight. So this is basically a night blooming plant. Well, that explains why I was finding all of these closed flowers during the day around Helena. And in Nebraska, what they found is that the common flower visitors were honeybees and sphinx moths. So this painted an interesting picture of these plants. Now, of course, there was a lot that was tentative about this. None of this was based on observations around where I was in Helena. A lot of it was extrapolating things from related species in the same genus, which we know is a little bit tentative for sure. So I wanted to get out in the field and just see what I could figure out. Oops, there we go. So I went out to Devil's Elbow Campground near Helena on a hot, windy afternoon. So this is a southeast aspect slope here. You can see this is some really ancient shale that I'm standing on. And there are just hundreds of these Menzelia plants growing on this slope. Now, all of these flowers are tightly closed in this mid-afternoon, which so far seems to be matching again with the Nebraska study this is definitely not a day bloomer. And so I started searching the foliage looking for insects here. And at first I wasn't finding anything. I was just, you know, noticing some little spots of dark sap on these plants. Now I did find something that surprised me a lot, which was several of these stems were nipped off at the tops. So I was trying to figure out what might've nipped these stems off. And I don't have a for sure answer, but my suspicion is deer. Now, for those of you uh, in the audience who are gardeners, it's not going to come as a surprise to you to know that deer just are really great at eating a lot of different plants, including a lot of plants that they aren't supposed to like. And I am still really puzzled if this was mule deer, as I suspect that we're browsing on these plants, to figure out how they feel afterwards. Like, do they enjoy that sandpapery texture in their stomachs? Do these plants offer some specific nutrients that they really like, uh, or do they kind of go away with a bellyache? 
anyhow, I still wasn't finding insects on these plants, but I wanted to keep looking for a while longer. And eventually my persistence paid off. So here you can see a tiny fly that's stuck to uh, the floral bracts of this Mentzelia bloom. You can see it's very dead. It's kind of shriveled up a little bit. And you can also see looking closely at these hairs that they're kind of barbed. These are not a pleasant thing to encounter if you're a soft bodied insect. Here's another dead fly that I found, again, stuck to the flower bracts. Now this is interesting because here's another insect, some sort of weevil that's crawling along these bracts, but this one was neither dead nor stuck. In fact, it was very nimble uh, moving across these bracts. I found several of these weevils and also a few small spiders that seemed to be able to navigate this forest of spined hairs with no problem at all. And based on another article that I looked at about Menzelia nuda, so again, a related species, there is a seed predator weevil or Thoris crotchi that's known to attack the seeds of that plant. So I suspected, although I have not confirmed, that this weevil may be either that same species or some relative that's a seed predator on Menzelia decapitala. At some point, it would be interesting to collect one of these and confirm the identification see if that's the case. But in spite of the live weevils, I continued to find more insects that were very dead on these plants. Here's a moth that got stuck. Here's another fly. And here's yet another moth. So I ended up collecting one of these flowers, including the bracts around it. And I wanted to take a closer look. So I went over to Carroll College and got under a dissecting microscope. And you can see here, this is at 40 times magnification. It's not a great photo, but you can see that these hairs again are really like kind of very narrow pine trees, these very barbed hairs. They do not look like a pleasant thing uh, for an insect to encounter. But again, we have some insects like this mysterious weevil that managed to walk right across these hairs with no problem at all. So that's pretty interesting. Now that same evening, I returned to the Mentzelia patch where I first started getting into these questions along the Centennial Trail. So right in the middle of Helena along this abandoned railroad track, really kind of desolate place. And here's this awesome, beautiful plant growing here. Now at this point, it's about eight o'clock in the evening. The sun's sinking, but it's still about 90 degrees out with just a bit of a breeze to lessen the intensity of the heat. And at this point, about an hour before sunset, these flowers are indeed starting to open just as seemed to be the suggestion based on the Nebraska study I read. And they have actually a subtle perfume. It's not very strong, just a little whiff of it. Now I was noticing that there were a few flies trapped here as well in this patch, although that wasn't my focus on this night. This is a bee fly, so it's a pretty large fly. And you can see based on the condition of its wings that it has been here for a while. But besides those dead insects, I was also noticing insects that seem to be very happy here on these flowers. And while in Nebraska, the main insects were uh, honeybees and sphinx moths, here what I was finding at this point were bumblebees. So this is a Hunt's bumblebee. This is a really common bumblebee species around Helena. And basically, if you see a bumblebee, with this red, the kind of reddish orange band of hairs across the abdomen, then best guess around Helena, it may be a Hunt's bumblebee. We actually have to take a closer look to confirm that it's not. There are a couple of other species it might be instead. And so I was doing that here. I was uh, netting bumblebees, transferring them to little plastic vials with pop-on tops, and then putting them in a cooler of ice and chilling them down to the point where I could take them out look at them in my hand with a little hand lens and key them out in the field. I confirmed that all of the bumblebees I was seeing in this patch were indeed Hunt's bumblebees, which is a really common species, seems to be very generalist in terms of its floral preferences. Um, I did an article uh, on the blog as well about bumblebees and floral preferences around Helena in the Helena Valley this summer. So check that out too, if you want uh, more information about that. Um, so this was interesting. Now this patch again is right in the middle of Helena. 
So we've got for sure some disturbance, a lot of urban development in the surrounding landscape. And I'd be really curious to repeat this in a more wild setting and see if we got some more bumblebee, bumblebee diversity or some other species of bees uh, on these flowers. It may just be that the Hunts bumblebee is particularly um, adaptable to urban environments, but I don't know that for sure. So as twilight was fading, I was still seeing um, Hunts bumblebees visiting these flowers, but I was starting to get curious about sphinx moths because Again, in that Nebraska study, there were sphinx moths that were common flower visitors on the Menzelia. Now, I wasn't seeing any yet. The bumblebees were kind of tapering off. And I was just struck here by the contrast. Like here I was kneeling in basically this wasteland along an abandoned railroad track. No one was around. I mean, there were a few people walking by looking at me like I was crazy, which maybe I am. I don't know. Um, and a few feet away from me, there was this abandoned couch that someone had dumped here. And here are these just incredibly gorgeous native plants, their flowers opening up at sunset. And how many people around Helena even know that this is a cool thing to look for in the middle of the summer? So I was feeling pretty lucky just to be here and, uh, and get to find this. So by about 9, 10 p.m., it seemed that the last of the bumblebees had finished their foraging for the evening. And so now I was just starting to get on edge. Was I going to see any sphinx moths or was this it for the evening? It was about 9.20 when I found the first sphinx moth. It was huge, larger than a hummingbird, I'd say, way bigger than I would have imagined. So its abdomen was as thick as my index finger with white spots on it, as you can see here. And when it flew, which it did silently in spite of its size. Its wings flashed this incredible um, rosy color. So I managed somehow, in spite of the near dark, to catch it in my insect net. And then I took it back and transferred it to a collapsible butterfly cage where I was able to get this photo and take a good look. And based on my photos, I was able to confirm that this is a white-lined sphinx. So this is a fairly common and widespread sphinx moth species. In spite of that, this is the first time that I had ever seen one around Helena. Now, this is not entirely surprising because the adults are mostly active at twilight and after dark. And these were just times that I had not been out looking for moths. This is a species that as a larva feeds on a few different plants, especially in the evening, the evening primrose family, Onagracee. So including species of willow herb, epilobium, and then also evening primrose, Onothera. So pretty cool to see these here. And once again, things were matching up with the Nebraska study. Now I saw a couple of these sphinx moths. It got a bit later, it was about 940. And I realized that I had forgotten to bring a headlamp with me, which unfortunately meant that I was done for the evening. Now, I had done quite a bit of observation and was kind of starting to get tired, so maybe this was a good thing. But in the near dark, in without a headlamp, I was noticing that there were a few other small moths flying around these plants. I couldn't tell if they were landing and actually visiting these flowers or if they were just flying around. So once again, it was just pointing out that there are clearly more questions to answer about these plants. Just got to dive in a little bit into this world enough to know that there was a lot more to learn, including besides these moths, perhaps might there also be nocturnal bee species that pollinate this plant. Now, that's nothing more than a hypothesis. Take it with a huge grain of salt, but it would be really cool at some point to check that out and see if that might be the case. So there's our first story. Moving on to the second one, showy milkweed. So this is a patch in the middle of the Helena Valley. And as you can see, this is a really nice big patch of showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa. Now this is at Westmont Farm and Gardens. You can see off to the left is York Road with its line of power poles, really busy thoroughfare through the Helena Valley. And I had gotten permission from Westmont Farm and Gardens to go here and spend a day taking a look at showy milkweed. I was especially curious about uh, monarch butterflies. Now, you all I'm sure have heard about how um, 
monarchs have this amazing long distance migration. They spend the winter either in California or in Michoacan, Mexico, depending on the population. And they basically their sole larval host plants are milkweeds in the genus Asclepius. So around Helena, that's primarily showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa. So basically, if we don't have this native plant around, we aren't going to expect that we have monarch larvae or monarchs, except in migration. And when I first moved to Montana, I kept kind of hearing through the grapevine that, no, no, we're between flyways. We don't really have monarchs here. Well, then a couple of years ago, I met Laura Alvey, who lives at the edge of the Helena Valley in the background of this picture near the Scratch Gravel Hills. She has planted a large patch of showy milkweed around her house. And she told me that basically every summer, or most summers at least, she had monarchs come in and oviposit on her milkweed. And she and her kids took some of these caterpillars inside and raised them to adulthood in a terrarium, feeding them fresh milkweed leaves, and then released the adults into the wild. So that was my first clue that, well, we actually do have monarchs in Montana. My second clue was more recent when I learned that between 2019 and 2021, Maggie Hershauer and an amazing group of volunteers did some great citizen science work, well, science and citizen science work in the Bitterroot Valley in Western Montana, where milkweed doesn't seem to be nearly as common as it is around Helena, but they were still finding a few monarchs in that area. So over that three year period, they found 41 wild monarch eggs and larvae on the milkweed patches. And it's still an open question where those monarchs are going, whether they're part of the population that heads more westerly and winters in California, or whether they're part of the population that heads down to Michoacan, Mexico for the winter. So I got really excited when I saw this Western tiger swallowtail land, because this is another really big butterfly, really bright, and so when I first caught a glimpse of it out of the corner of my eye, I thought, monarch. And then I realized, no, I was wrong. But still, these are great butterflies. It was pretty neat to see it on the milkweed here. Now, it took me a while longer, but maybe half an hour later, I did find a monarch here. And so this was pretty exciting. At least they were stopping over and using this patch. At least they were finding it. Now, I was a little bit disappointed to see that when this monarch opened its wings, I could see on the dorsal surface of the hind wing that it had a small black spot in the middle of the wing. That told me it was a male, so this was not one that I was going to be able to follow and see it laying eggs on this milkweed patch. So, well, shoot, there goes that plan. I was back to the drawing board, and the drawing board in this case meant searching thousands and thousands of milkweed leaves in this milkweed jungle, hoping to find a monarch egg or a tiny caterpillar, or maybe I'd get lucky and find a late instar larva that's really colorful and easy to spot. So I started really carefully searching these leaves. And this got pretty discouraging pretty fast because I didn't know entirely what I was looking for. And I felt like I was probably doing it wrong. There were probably hundreds of monarch eggs that I was walking right past here. But nevertheless, I found some other really cool things. So look at this leaf tip, and you can see how it has this pretty neat semicircle cut out of it. Well, it turns out that that is a feeding sign of the milkweed longhorn beetle, Tetraopis species. So the, the species in this genus, um, most of them are, are specialist herbivores on milkweeds. And so the larvae feed underground on the milkweed roots, the adults feed on the foliage, and once they mate, they'll lay their eggs at the base of a milkweed stem, and that completes their life cycle. Their life cycle. So this is pretty cool to see. This is a really colorful uh, group of species. Again, you aren't going to find them except around milkweed for these species that are milkweed specialists of Tetraopis. And this is a species that doesn't get nearly as much attention or press as monarchs do. So it was pretty cool to see these here and to know that they have this connection, this really specialized connection with this plant as well. Now, I also found some small milkweed bugs. These are really colorful bugs. They look a little bit like box elder bugs, which come into our houses in the winter to try to stay warm, but these are quite distinct. And uh, these ones are sort of, uh, they have a somewhat generalist diet. They'll eat milkweed foliage, they'll go after the seeds, 
They will also scavenge dead insects in these patches. Sometimes they'll even feed on monarch larvae if they can find them. And they will move away from milkweed patches to other uh, plants on occasion. But typically, this is where you'll find them, is in milkweed patches. So another really colorful insect, really cool to see them here. Now I was finding some other insects too. These are generalists that we can expect to find in a lot of places, not just on milkweed. So on the left here, we've got this seven spot ladybug. This is an introduced species that feeds on aphids as do a number of our native ladybug species. And then on the right here, we've got a two striped grasshopper. Like many grasshoppers, this is a generalist and will eat all sorts of plants. But given that milkweeds can have varying degrees of toxicity, and uh, definitely have a milky sap that seems to be a defense against herbivores. It was pretty interesting to find this one here, uh, and presumably it was getting ready to feed, although I did not see that with this individual. So then I lucked out. I was getting ready to give up, and I turned around, and here's this very colorful late instar monarch larva among the flower buds of one of the milkweed plants. So this was really exciting to find. Now we already knew based on Laura Alvey's yard that we did have milkweeds uh, breeding successfully in the Helena Valley, but here was just another example of that and another patch where milkweed, where um, monarchs for sure were breeding in the milkweed. Now the other thing that was exciting about this is a few weeks after I did this field foray and wrote about it, I ended up calling uh, Westmont again to get permission for something else from them. And I ended up talking to this woman who's worked there for about 30 years. And she told me that this milkweed patch is about 30 years old. And it started out as just a few plants, but they've not only tolerated it, they've actually been kind of happy to see it there along the irrigation ditch. And so they've let it spread. And over time, it's turned into just this awesome forest where we have, you know, milkweed longhorn beetles and small milkweed bugs and also monarchs. So this was pretty cool and it was just really heartwarming to see how excited she was to hear that there were monarchs using this patch. Now the timing of this was also, it was actually I believe the same day that the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, had listed monarchs as an endangered species. Uh, so that's not a regulatory listing like the US Fish and Wildlife Service listings are, but it means that they're in really bad trouble. So the California overwintering population has declined something like 99%. The Mexican population isn't in quite as bad shape, but around an 80% decline in the last few decades. So not good news. Given all of that, it was especially exciting to find this here. Now, there's actually more to the story of milkweed than just the monarchs and these other specialist insects. And I'm going to kind of skim past some of this because there's a lot more I have to cover. But here you can see an ant that's gathering nectar from these flowers. And you can see this weird structure stuck to its leg. So that's actually a packet of pollen. Milkweed packages its pollen into these funny shaped packets instead of just having loose pollen grains like a lot of other plants do. And these flowers can be traps. I was seeing lots of honeybees. So, you know, this non-native pollinator species that's kind of a trash pollinator, if you will, but at the same time is really important for agriculture and honey. And I was seeing lots and lots of these. They were for sure the dominant pollinators on these flowers on this state. Most of them seem to be doing fine, but here I found this dead one that actually got stuck to the flower. So in the middle of this flower between the petals, there's kind of this barrel-like structure with slits in it. And that's where uh, the plant um, has these pollen packages. And so sometimes an insect will uh, slip its leg in there. Often it gets away and carries a pollen packet with it, but sometimes it gets stuck and can't get away like this honeybee. So just another kind of interesting thing about milkweed plants. Okay, so we are going to keep going and take a look at leafy spurge. So this is really interesting because this plant is non-native. It's on the noxious weeds list. Everyone except for me hates this plant. But what I've noticed in my insect work around Helena the past couple of years is just a pretty phenomenal diversity of insects visiting these flowers. Now, these are also weird flowers. Uh, I won't get into all of the details here, but you can see in this image on the left 
that besides, um, I'm not sure if you all can see my mouse, but there's kind of this um, ovary structure here and here are the pistils coming out of it. So that's the female flower structure that's gonna turn into the fruit. Here we've also got um, some stamens that are out of focus around it that are releasing pollen. And then we've got these really funny horseshoe shaped structures. And these are extra floral nectaries. So uh, these are providing nectar. It's really accessible and a lot of insects are responding at least in the stands I've watched around Helena. So we've got just this amazing diversity of wasps and beetles and flies that come into these flowers. So why is that? Is it just that these are generalist insects that are like, hey, here's a great nectar source, let's take advantage of it? Or is there more to this relationship? Because this plant is recent on the landscape. There's not a lot of co-evolutionary history with our native insects like there is with, you know, something like, let's say our asters or goldenrods. Uh, or sunflowers. But there is a native relative, horn spurge. It's smaller, seems to have a shorter flowering period, and I'm not very familiar with it. So that occurs to me as another thought. Maybe some of these insects have had an evolutionary relationship with these species and have just crossed over and really benefited from the presence of leafy spurge on the landscape. But basically, there are just a lot of questions here that uh, are going to take some more digging. But what's been interesting is I've just really dug into the life histories of some of these insects that I've found on the leafy spurge. And it just opens up, you know, this whole amazing web of trophic interactions. So this is an ichneumonid wasp in the genus Natelia. Ichneumonids are extremely diverse and very hard to identify to species in general. A lot of them aren't very well known. There are actually a lot of undescribed species still. But this genus of ichneumonids are parasitoids on caterpillars. So they lay their eggs on caterpillars. The larvae basically eat the caterpillar from the inside out. It's not good for the caterpillars, which means that it may be good for the plants that the caterpillars are feeding on in terms of regulating caterpillar populations. So here are some more ichneumonids. These are all ones that I've collected this year from leafy spurge flowers. And you can see just incredible diversity. I don't know the identities of most of these yet. But I uh, had the fortune of getting to know a PhD student at Utah State University named Brandon Claridge, who is studying ichneumonid systematics. So all of these specimens I've collected are going to him at the end of the year. Hopefully, eventually, I'll be able to find out who they are and learn a little bit more about their stories, um, which insects they parasitize, what they're doing out here, um, and maybe be able to contribute something to that knowledge. It's not just parasitoids. Here is a tachysphex wasp. So this is a predatory wasp that hunts grasshoppers, crickets, or their relatives. Here's another wasp, Cryptochelus terminatus, that is a spider wasp. So this one predates wolf spiders and uh, stalks its underground nests with those wolf spiders. Here is a species of Oxybelus. So this is a small wasp that hunts small flies and provisions its nest with them. Now, besides all of these presumably native flower visitors, I also was finding some biocontrol insects on the leafy spurge. So these have been introduced in hopes of reducing the competitiveness of leafy spurge on the landscape. So here's the leafy spurge hawk moth. It hasn't been very effective in Montana, but it's a really cool insect. Highly recommend these caterpillars if you get the chance to see one, they're really fun. Here's a stem boring beetle. These have been somewhat effective particularly in combination with the leafy spurge flea beetles. There are a variety of species of aphthona. I haven't keyed this one out yet, but I'm pretty sure this is what this is, uh, that feed on leafy spurge. And these beetles do seem to be somewhat effective or fairly effective in certain contexts in uh, reducing leafy spurge populations. So before I move on from leafy spurge, I've just got to say that this is a really interesting topic to me, and it raises all sorts of questions Basically, I think what this does, you know, the qualitative observations I've made around Helena of a huge diversity of insects visiting leafy spurge flowers, is it just adds some more nuance to the conversation about invasive plants. It's so easy, especially uh, when it comes to public messaging and stuff, to just say, oh, invasive plants are bad. They're killing our native plants and ecosystems. And yes, 
they can outcompete our native plants. They can cause problems. But also, in some cases, they are providing some sort of habitat for some creatures. At the very minimum, they're photosynthesizing and holding the soil in place. And leafy spurge is definitely a weed of concern. There are just acres and acres and acres that it's taken over across the West, lots of rangeland. Undoubtedly, it's displaced native plants in some cases. But what's interesting is looking at the whole context, including these relationships with insects and including, well, what other plants is it sharing the landscape with? So on this stream restoration site near Helena, where I've made most of these observations, leafy spurge is growing in disturbed areas along the stream in fairly small patches. And it's in this matrix that's dominated by non-native grasses, specifically smooth brome, uh, bromus inermis, crested wheatgrass, agropyron cristatum, and intermediate wheatgrass, agropyron intermedium. Now, all of these species are highly competitive as well. They're also much more dominant on this site than the leafy spurges. And in the mix as well, we have um, willow herb, Epilobium ciliatum, which is native. We have a few other somewhat sort of, you know, adaptable, slightly weedy native species here, wild licorice, Glycerhiza lepidota, um, a couple of species of our native goldenrods, Solidago, and a few other species like that in these disturbed areas along the stream. Unfortunately, what I've seen on this site is land managers who are not botanists and are not even looking at these insects or the context of these communities who have hired contractors without much oversight to come in and spray herbicides for leafy spurge and other noxious weeds. Now, the herbicides they're using are things like 2,4-D that are broadleaf selective. So what I've seen happen here is that they kill the leafy spurge. Well, clearly they didn't kill all of it because uh, all of this field work was after several years of spraying and I was still able to find some decent leafy spurge patches here. But then they also ended up impacting a lot of the native species, the goldenrods, the willow herbs, the wild licorice. And what they didn't impact because these herbicides were broadleaf selective was the invasive grasses. Oh, except they aren't actually on the Montana noxious weeds list. Grasses like smooth brome, crested wheatgrass, intermediate wheatgrass that are unquestionably non-native, but cows like to eat them. So maybe that's why they haven't ended up on the noxious weeds list. So basically what I was seeing here is leafy spurge branded as this bad weed, uh, these good hearted efforts to try to control it that we're reducing in the loss of native biodiversity, as well as the loss of this, you know, potential habitat for quite a few different insects and replacing it with more or less a monoculture of smooth brome and other invasive grasses that provide habitat for very little except for grasshoppers, or at least pushing the community in that direction. So this is a case where I think it's important to look at this sort of nuance and maybe consider some different management directions. On this site, I would really suggest that um, beneficial management for habitat might consist of really focusing on efforts that might include herbicide use, but that are focused on uh, reestablishing diversity and cover of native plants on this site, including perhaps some species of native plants that have um, lots of available nectar that might, um, you know, draw some of these same insects like the ichneumonid wasps that currently are using this leafy spurge. And then maybe we could also look at reducing the leafy spurge. Maybe the biocontrol insects are doing a good enough job on this site and we really don't have anything to worry about. Okay, so I'm pushing it a little bit on time and just going to show you one more story here. So this is moving over to Missoula. And this is my mom's yard, which she has covered with native plants and fruit trees over the last few years. And so in mid-August, I came over here and I wanted to just take a look because, you know, we all talk about, or many of us talk about native plants and how we want them in our yards and around our neighborhoods. And we want to restore them in disturbed areas because they're so good for native insects and birds and biodiversity. But I really wanted to zoom in and see like, okay, if we spend a day looking at a yard, what can we actually find here? And so there were five species of plants that were uh, the common bloomers at this season in my mom's yard. And we just spent some time looking at them, doing something similar to what I was doing with the bumblebees earlier this summer, uh, catching insects, putting them in vials on ice, and then taking macro photos before they would fly off again. 
Now, we weren't so successful on the identification side of things on this day. A lot of these insects, especially the bees, I really have trouble with, especially when they're warming up because it's 90 plus degrees out and they're flying off really fast. So that's why most bee researchers collect a lot of insects and look at specimens in the lab. That's really what it takes to get down to species or sometimes even genus for a lot of these. And it's a steep learning curve. But in spite of that, what we were doing here was something that anyone can do in their yard, which is just to take a look, spend some time looking at the flowers, looking at the insects and distinguishing basic patterns. And the basic patterns we were finding here were pretty cool. So this is Echinacea purpurea, purple coneflower. It's not native to Montana, although Echinacea angustifolia, the narrow leaf coneflower, is in eastern Montana, but this one is an, a species of eastern North America. So not really quite native here. Anyhow, there was some of it in my mom's yard and I wanted to include it and just see what was here. So mostly what we were finding on these flowers was male bumblebees um, with this red band, orange band across the abdomen. Probably more hunts bumblebees, but the males are harder to identify and I wasn't sure. Also woodland skipper butterflies, and then a few small bees, but not too many of them. Also just one lone honeybee that we saw in these flowers. Then we get into some plants that are legitimately native to Montana. So here's smooth blue aster, Symphiotricum livae. And what we were finding here was some more woodland skippers and then a variety of medium and small bees. And these bees were definitely collecting pollen from these flowers. And there were a lot of them. So just on two plants, I estimated we were seeing about 12 skippers and 40 bees at any one time. And you can just see based on my photos here, you know, we can distinguish some differences in the bees, at least when we have them iced and a little bit more cooperative. Some of them have broad uh, bands of white hairs on the abdomen. Some hardly have bands on the abdomen at all. Um, so even without identifying them, we can at least kind of pick out some of the diversity and see how that's differing. There were also a few other skippers. Here's one up here that is either a common branded skipper or a Western branded skipper. Like, like the woodland skipper, this is a butterfly whose larvae feed on grasses. Now these bees are pretty cool too, because these are not honeybees. So these are probably mostly native species that are generally solitary, nesting either in the ground or in plant stems. So this, it would be interesting to actually know which species these are and be able to get into this in more detail, but it's telling us that even in urban Missoula, we do have some native bees that we're supporting. Presumably these flowers are helping them out, and maybe if we could look on a neighborhood scale at bringing in more patches of flowers, more patches of bare ground of different substrates, and also leaving dead plant stems during the winter, uh, we might be able to support more of these. It would be interesting to look at that more. We also had Rocky Mountain bee plant, so this is a native annual. I love these plants, but the pollinators that were visiting them were not as numerous, and really honestly, it was mostly honeybees that were visiting these flowers on this particular day in this yard. There were a few skippers, and there were a few ants that were mostly prospecting on these unopened flower buds. But so, you know, we're seeing these different plants and very different communities of insects on them, just like I was talking about at the beginning. On the Missouri goldenrod, which you can see is really happy in this yard, I've never seen it quite this luxurious in the wild. It was lots of wasps, and I have not identified these wasps to species, but these are probably some more of our predatory wasps. If I had to take a slightly educated guess, I would think that these are probably in the family Crobronidae, um, like some of the predatory wasps I showed you earlier. So they're hunting some groups of insects. We'd have to figure out what these wasps actually are to know which groups of insects, and pretty cool to see them on the goldenrod. Now there were also some of these small tan herbivorous bugs on them. And then finally, we have some Maximilian sunflower. Actually, I'm a little bit curious on this sunflower. It seems a little bit puzzling in terms of, is it really Maximilian sunflower or is it more like Nuttall's sunflower or is it some hybrid? Um, but in any case, once again, very different community of insects here. Lots and lots of bees and a lot of diversity. And you can see just looking at the pictures here that these bees look a lot different than the bees on the smooth blue aster. I'll just flip back to that for a minute. 
okay, here's our smooth blue aster with a few of its bees. And here's the Maximilian sunflower. So you can see just some of these have really long antennae. Some have these really cool um, brushes of hairs on their forelegs. And so once again, even without identifying these two species, we can just see there's a good bit of diversity in this yard. So that's pretty cool to see. Now there's also this, uh, this beetle up here. This is a blister beetle, family Meloidae. I believe this species is Epicotta ferruginea or one of its close relatives. And if I'm correct about that, then this has a really interesting life history because its larvae actually crawl around in the soil hunting for grasshopper egg pods and then they eat those grasshopper eggs, which is interesting in urban Missoula because I wasn't really seeing grasshoppers in this yard. So it may have flown in from somewhere where there were grasshoppers. So once again, the cool thing about this day was that even without drilling down to the species level and really knowing the full stories that there are here, we got to see some cool patterns. And we got to see that, yes, it does seem that adding in more species of native plants in this yard is providing habitat for a greater diversity of insects. And some of those in particular, like the sunflower and the goldenrod and the smooth blue aster seem to be particularly unique based on this, you know, sort of one day, very anecdotal sample in terms of their pollinator communities. So that's pretty cool. And once again, all it takes to do this is a macro lens, an insect net, some uh, little plastic vials or film canisters and a cooler with ice. So you can do this in your yard or in your neighborhood or wherever you are. And I think that's pretty cool. So that's it. I've covered a lot of ground and it's been fast. And I'm really excited to, to have some discussion and hear your questions. And um, yeah, let's see. Um, oh, right, okay. So before I get to that though, here's the information for where you can find um, more of my stories, including more depth about all of these ones I've shared tonight. Besides um, insects and plants and how they interact, I also write about birds and watersheds and the little bit I know about geology and any other topics uh, that one of you want to go out in the field with me and uh, talk about and learn about. Um, right now I'm based in Missoula. I'm kind of between here and Helena uh, moving forward. So if you are near either of those cities and would like to bring me along on your cool project that's related to natural history or ecology and be able to get the word out about this and share those stories, in a way that's hopefully accessible to people, please let me know. Um, you can, again, you can find this work on the website. You can also uh, search for what's going on out there wherever you find podcasts and listen to them that way. And then I will just say as well that all of this work is freely available. The most important thing to me is just getting the word out about it. As long as I'm spending my weeks doing this work, I want it to be reaching people and meaning something. So feel free to share it with anyone that this might be interesting to. And at the same time, uh, my business model for this is it's all free and it's all supported by donations. So if you go to my website, there's a link to a Patreon page there where you can make a monthly donation if you're in a position to do that. No pressure on that. I definitely don't expect that, but it does allow me to keep going with this work. So with that said, I am going to stop sharing my screen or maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so write this information down if you want it or um, you can also just Google my name and it'll come up um, and let's get to discussion. I'm really excited about that. Thanks again for listening to me talk at you. Great, Shane. Thank you for the, the great stories. And wow, your photos are fantastic. So that, that has really, really been a treat. Um, and there's some good discussion going on here um, in the chat. So first of all, Fraser Watson, who's out in Sydney in Eastern Montana, he works for the Agricultural Research Station out there. He wanted to let you know that he's seen nocturnal bees on the manzilia and he oh my he gosh the genus lasioglossum so you guys are going to need to talk and Fraser, i don't know if you're inclined to unmute yourself if you wanted to give us a few more details on that um would you like to tell us about the nocturnal bees
All right. Well, anyway, we'll um, we'll hope that you guys can talk in the future. But very cool to know that um, that indeed someone's seen them. So that's very exciting to hear. Yeah. Thank you so the, the genus is Lazioglossum. Very I large think. genus of bees. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. But, but then he clarified it with uh, Specodogastra, which I'm totally mutilating that word. But anyway. Okay. He, he knew right. some details on it. So anyway. Right. So that might be yeah. a surgeon. Awesome. Yeah. And then regarding the monarchs, um, Denise in Bozeman had monarch butterfly eggs on her showy milkweed in Bozeman several years ago. And she brought some in and had a monarch hatch and was able to release it. Um, and she shared that during that time, which was about four or five years ago, she had about 18 above ground stems in an area she had planted about 10 by 12 feet um, wow. and it's kind of growing now and she says that she searches every year for eggs but she's read that ants prey on the eggs um, as well yeah wow that is so exciting to know that even a patch that small can support monarchs that's really exciting for you know all of the gardening projects that we're doing in small areas in cities that it's not just you know the massive patch that i was looking at um, right, that right. Habitat. and that they find that's these that's newly small. planted ones is great yeah yeah um and then as far as noxious weeds wendy uh, and Billings shared that, you know, she says many noxious weeds are pretty shameless with offering lots of pollinator rewards to make sure they get pollinated. One of the factors that lead to a very successful reproduction and the large diversity of advantageous insects taking advantage of the abundant resources the weeds are offering. It is a slight worry if we remove large patches of weeds when it takes time for natives to recolonize. So you've got kind of a loss of a food for the insects, perhaps. Yeah, and thank you so much for, for mentioning that as well, Wendy, because that gets into some really interesting questions about, depending on the system and the context, um, are those noxious weeds, let's say, um, like, are they competing with our native plants for pollinators and actually like drawing off pollinators that would otherwise be pollinating native plants? Or are they actually boosting the carrying capacity um, of the habitat for certain pollinators? And that's presumably gonna be really context dependent. In the case of the leafy spurge around Helena, um, I was not seeing many bees at all on those flowers. So it was mostly wasps that really aren't collecting pollen. So they're really just going after the nectar. They tend to be generalists, but I also wasn't seeing these wasps on a lot of other flowers there. So just like you're saying in that system, it seems like we really would need to be looking at adding in more native plants that are providing similar resources uh, for those pollinators as we're looking at also maybe uh, removing or limiting the leafy spurge populations. So cool topic and definitely complicated. Yeah, and along the same lines, Karen shares that as a former weed manager, I agree with you that the goal is to eradicate noxious weed species, but we really consider restoring native plants. And as a result, we're often replacing noxious herbaceous plants with non-native grasses. And I've often wondered if we're actually improving the habitat as we, yeah. um, as we know, that's a, a tough one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, so we're getting a lot of thank yous, terrific photos, and a few people are interested in your macro photo equipment and what kind of camera and lens you're using. Yeah, okay. Um, so for most, for the macro stuff, um, I really am keeping it pretty simple. I have a Google Pixel phone, so it's got a pretty good camera. And then I've got a little 10 times lens uh, that hooks onto it with a special adapter. That lens, uh, the one I'm using is made by a company called Moment. Um, I think there are some other manufacturers. And if I remember right, that macro lens was about $100. The problem with it is that the focal distance is really short. So I have to have a very cooperative insect or a very frozen insect to get good photos. Um, but under those conditions, it's great for macro photos of insects or plants. Um, there are a lot of other setups I know that people have, and 
at least for folks in the Missoula area. Um, Christy Dubois is one person I would point you towards, who I know she's really gotten into macro photography and knows way more than I do. Um, so yeah, that's what I know. Very good, very good. And Barbara was asking um, if anyone's been successful growing um, the Blazing Star from Seed, she'd appreciate the tips. And then we do have um, Robin Klein chimed in um, that she's grown both um, Decap Decapetala and Le Leviculus, the yellow one. She's grown them both. And she says they're tiny seeds that germinate slowly. Um, and Robin, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and say anything else about um, about how you um, how you grew these. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Shane. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, yeah, I went out and collected the seed uh, one late summer, and uh, yeah, I've been able to grow both of them. They are generally speaking uh, biennials. Uh, but sometimes they will come back. So uh, I just had them in a pot um, so that I didn't have them mixing, so I wouldn't lose them with the other plants. But yeah, as I recall, um, I'm trying to remember, I might have used cold stratification on them, but you just have to stick with it <laughs> and try. And I, I didn't get a lot of plants, but uh, and I noticed that the beetle larvae were eating a lot of the seeds in the pods. So that just finding the seeds is kind of difficult to do sometimes. Uh, but my uh, didn't, mine didn't seem to get the insects. And I think it is because there was only a few of them and they're out in the middle of Bozeman, <laughs> you know, or south of Bozeman where they don't normally, normally uh, grow. So yeah, and to photograph them, please photograph these guys. They're just, I can send you some photographs, Shane. They're just Thanks. gorgeous. Yeah, that's awesome. And the Manzilia levocollis is a really cool plant too. I'd like to dig into it more at some point. If yeah. I remember right, it's a day bloomer and maybe you can confirm. Uh, it's a night bloomer. Oh, it, is. Okay. Uh, it, it closes up in the morning. Um, okay. But another thing uh, is you can use a black light and the pollen will fluoresce. Wow. At night. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So we could maybe see whether uh, a sphinx moth is running off with any pollen or not. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. Very good. And Wendy Velman wants to make sure you know about the Montana Moth Project. And Matt in there in Missoula says she'd love to talk night pollinators with you. So yes, he's been on my list. I still need to get in touch with him. Great. Looking forward Great. to that. Yeah. And uh, Alexandra over in um, Sweetgrass County, she says, has anyone successfully planted native flowers in a stand of leafy spurge? We have smooth brome and leafy spurge by a stream and are stumped. We've released flea beetles on the spurge, but so far three years have not seen a reduction in the spurge. Yeah, and I'm curious if anyone else um, has some experience that they can chime in on that. Unfortunately, my experience with leafy spurge has mostly been looking at the insects on it and then seeing it get sprayed along with the native plants around it. Um, yeah. I have not been able to, I haven't had a chance yet to play with um, adding native plants to those stands. I'd be really curious if anyone has experience with that as well. Yeah. All right. So Christy in Missoula says that the Sphinx moths love her golden current when it blooms. So that's nice. cool. Oh, and Matt, Matt is saying to Alexandra, maybe she should work on reducing the smooth brome um, more than you know, getting at the um, the spurge as much as the as the brome, because or yeah, yeah. So that's probably a good tip there, and that's Alexandra kind of agrees with that. She doesn't want to hurt all the insects and spiders and and spray the spurge. Mm -hmm. um, and Noel says, have you tried covering small patches and replanting the dead areas with um, native seed banks, but? It's a, uh, it's definitely tough stuff. And mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess another thought I have, because 
I mean, they are both rhizomatous species, so it makes them very competitive and, you know, they really hold their ground once they get established, both the smooth brome and the leafy spurge. Um, but I would wonder um, whether it might be possible, um, as Noel was suggesting, to, you know, cover certain areas with black plastic or something for a while if you're working on a small scale to uh, at least reduce those rhizomatous species for a while. And then maybe, I, again, this is untested by me. I'd be curious if anyone else has experience, but I would wonder about maybe transplanting in some of our more competitive um, native species like some of the goldenrods and stuff uh, so that they're already somewhat established. I mean, seeds of course would be great to try too, but just to get something that has some ability to compete with those rhizomatous species. Yeah. Well, we can continue our discussion a little bit. I am, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop the recording now. So well, um, we thank everyone for being here. And it was a great evening. So good to see you all.